you may be aware that Sri Lanka is well known uh, for its high, very high suicide rate. It's not something uh, I'm sure any Sri Lankan is, is proud of. In fact, in 1996, Sri Lanka had the high suicide rate in the world with almost nearly 9,000 people committing suicide in that year. Now that's an average of 24 people committing suicide a day. Um, today, Sri Lanka is still amongst one of the highest uh, in, in the world for suicide rates. However, it has, uh, the rate has dropped to 11, approximately 11, yeah, approximately 11 uh, people committing suicide every day. And I'm sure everyone would agree that 11 too many. We have a panel um, who would like to share with you their thoughts and their expertise about mental health in, in Sri Lanka um, and how helplines such as CCC Line or, or Lifeline here in Australia um, will provide relief but also uh, prevent suicide um, in those countries. And also we'd like to share um, some great initiatives here in Australia and how that perhaps links, uh, links to Sri Lanka as well. And we also have a very, very personal story that we would like to share. So, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, joining me uh, on the panel is none other than Kumar Sangakara, um, Sri Lankan Cricket and CCC Line Ambassador. <laughs> Next to Kumar is, uh, is Mary Parsons. She is the President of Lifeline International <laughs> and also uh, a board member of CCC Foundation. Um, next to Mary is Associate Professor Dr. Harry Minnis. Uh, he is the Director of uh, Centre for International Mental Health, Melbourne School of Population Health, uh, Melbourne University, and has an immense uh, amount of experience working in Sri Lanka as well, in that capacity. Um, we have then Linnell uh, Angus, who is the Indigenous and Priority Communities Program Leader from Beyond Blue. And, um, next to um, uh, Linnell is Vivian Archball, Archdoll, sorry, uh, who is the coordinator of Mind Matters, who do wonderful work uh, with, with school students here in Victoria. How about a big hand for Vivian? Yeah? <laughs> Lastly, but not least, we have Carmel Crawford, uh, and thank you, Carmel, for coming today, who will share with you uh, an experience of suicide, in, uh, a close member of a family suiciding. Um, uh, which is quite tragic. So, ladies and gentlemen, once again, please welcome the panel. Come on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with you uh, first. Um, now, Sri Lanka is a country that has suffered too much as past, marred with, um, you know, war, uh, a, a, you know, a natural disaster. What do you see, personally, as the main contributors of uh, mental health issues or and suicide in the in your country? I think I, I did a bit of research because, uh, unlike the rest of the panel, I don't think I'm, I'm qualified to, to talk about this in, in depth. So I, I did a bit of research, and um, you know, mental health uh, and, and mental health issues, and then suicides. Uh, mental health issues uh, are on the rise in Sri Lanka, and that is uh, mainly due to uh, a 35-year conflict and also poor social socio-economic conditions, uh, poverty. Uh, lack of nutrition, uh, a lack of basic health care facilities, uh, but, and also the 2004 tsunami. Um, there's also a, a very urgent shortage of health care professionals. I think in Sri Lanka it's about one psychiatrist to about 500,000 people. But those psychiatrists are also uh, more uh, prevalent to, to, to house themselves in and around urban areas. Um, there's also quite a lot of trained staff in, in mental health care, in the mental health care services. They're not trained or sensitive enough to identify and deal with people who are suffering with, with mental health issues. Um, suicide, of course, in Sri Lanka, we've had some of the highest suicide rates in the world. Suicide uh, among women is on the increase. It's second only to China um, in the world. Um, they happen. I think due to a lot of reasons. Uh, in Sri Lanka, it's mainly due to relationship issues, love affairs gone wrong, um, there's poverty, parental pressure on marriage, there's uh, fear of 
examinations and failure examinations. There's um, in inability to pay loans. Um, I think we had a spate of suicides when there was um, a huge issue among farmers and, and the growing of tomatoes when that particular industry collapsed. And a lot of farmers committed suicide uh, because they could not pay back, uh, pay back their loans. Um, and in recent years, we've also had a lot of women uh, going to the Middle East to work. And that's also um, resulted in an increase in, in suicides. Uh, also in Sri Lanka, you have very easy access to, to very lethal poisons, especially because they are not as regulated as they should be, and they are largely available to the rural farming communities. Uh, and because emergency services and lack of quality uh, healthcare uh, services, and also the, the lack of cheap antidotes, means that almost always uh, self-poisoning is, is fatal. Um, so there are quite a number of issues that, that do contribute, but I, I think, especially with mental health issues, it's compounded by the fact that in Sri Lanka it's always been taboo. You don't talk about mental health issues. Uh, if you have someone in your family who's suffering from mental health issues, they're usually hidden away because they think that it shames the family, it affects the marriage uh, um, opportunities of other members of the family. So it is something that you are encouraged to forget. And even in our national um, health services, you find that mental health issues uh, and services around them are underfunded and ignored. Thanks, Kumar. And, and, and as the ambassador of CCC Line, why do you think um, a telephone counselling service like CCC Line is useful you know, in Sri Lanka as a result of mental health or suicide? I think in Sri Lanka, the, the way we are brought up, um, most often anyone with, with mental health issues are, are judged. Um, they're not encouraged to talk about it. Um, and also, if you do talk about it, I think they're afraid of, of confidentiality issues and of course um, of, of, of their issues being made public and they are again uh, bringing more shame and, and they are compounding the problems. Also CCC Line I think and other counselling services, uh, they don't judge, they listen, they try and help empower that particular person to deal with the problems themselves and if they can't, they usually refer them to, to specialist care and other services available in that particular region. Uh, when people have mental health issues, they always, um, uh, you know, try to cope with that crisis. But when the problem becomes too much and the ability to cope breaks down, um, that's when, when they're most vulnerable and they're left frustrated um, and they do not have access to services like counselling, then problems can get worse. Of course, not everyone with mental health issues is suicidal. Um, but um, at the same time, this allows a great deal of anonymity, but also confidentiality, and the ability to access trained healthcare, uh, sorry, mental, mental healthcare professionals. And I think if we can make these services more available, uh, the burden on a lot of people will be lessened, a lot of families will be lessened, um, and also in Sri Lanka, I think the most vulnerable section now identified um, uh, with, with mental health issues are children. So actually, it's, it's, it's a lot to do with rebuilding a society in a post conflict, post tsunami country. Thanks, Kamal. Mary, um, I'll come to you next. Uh, Mary, you were instrumental in um, putting Lifeline Hobart and CCC together and, um, you know, uh, resulting in CCC Line. You visited Sri Lanka, you've actually uh, done some work with CCC Line in, in Colombo. Um, based on your experience internationally, how is Sri Lanka placed amongst other countries in the region in terms of the number of people affected by mental health and suicide? Listening to what Kumar said, I think that uh, it, it reflects a lot of the issues that are around the Asia-Pacific region that I've seen. Um, I remember going to Samoa, where they equally were not not storing the paraquat, which is used to kill the weeds around the taro plants. And I remember them saying, had a flyer out saying, 
two teaspoons of paraquat will kill you. And I thought, if I was suicidal and I read that, I would have three teaspoons and I would make sure I was going to die. Because the difficulty with the weed killer is that it is just about irreversible unless it's reversed very, very quickly. And as Kumar said, it's, it's not always able to do that. So people endure a slow, agonising death for about three weeks before they die. So I think that what I see in, in Sri Lanka and listening to what Kumar said is exactly right. That there's a lot of mental health issues that are not recognised. There is a stigma around mental health issues in some of the Asia-Pacific countries. And of course that's been true in Australia. And I remember in my childhood and even beyond that, where mental health has a stigma and still does have a stigma it's still a stigmatising issue for us in Australia to have a mental health issue, but it is more so in some of these Pacific Island and Asian countries. So I think that, um, you know, Lifeline Australia gets over half a million genuine calls a year. If you look at our population in Australia, it's about the same size as that population of Sri Lanka, spread over a much broader region. So when you think about half a million calls that we get, and you think of the number of helplines that are in Australia, when you think of the number of mental health services that are available to people in Australia, freely and fairly easily accessible, not perfect, but better than in some of these countries, and we still need lots of helplines that provide an excellent service, then when you look at somewhere like Sri Lanka, which is struggling with some of the issues that Kumar talked about, then it, it's an ongoing issue for them and I think CCC line provides an excellent service there, it fills a big gap. Thanks Mary. Mary, telephone councils like um, Lifeline and CCC line uh, obviously I think undoubtedly offer immediate emo emotional support. However, is there any evidence to show that, um, that having contacted a helpline people would be more willing to get other professional help afterwards? There's a lot of research being done around helplines and the um, efficacy of helplines, and that's been done internationally. And some of the research has shown that the helplines provide an immediate anonymous first contact service. And when people contact the helpline and get a good response by well-trained volunteers or professionals, then they feel more empowered to actually go on and get further help. So with the encouragement of helplines, people then feel more empowered to go and get professional help, and that's been well validated by research. Thanks, Mary. Mary, um, Harry, if I can yeah, um, go to you next. I know you've done very successful work um, in developing mental health um, services in the southern province. And now you've just um, um, got a new project in the northern and eastern provinces. What would you say are the main risks and vulnerabilities for development of mental health problems amongst different sections of the Sri Lankan population? Demographics, at least. Well, I, I, I think Kumar summarised them very well. Somebody in the audience asked him what he was going to do after cricket. I think uh, there's a role in mental health for you, Kumar. Uh, yeah, the, you know, the understanding of what are the key issues, I think um, you presented very clearly. Uh, Long-running conflict uh, actually damages the fabric of society. Uh, people lose trust on both sides. Uh, the kinds of things that are necessary to hold people's lives together are destroyed, sometimes literally, sometimes uh, emotionally, sometimes in terms of the kinds of bonds and the, the trust that's necessary to even do basic things in life. There, there are some other issues, I think. Um, the, the place of women is an issue in Sri Lanka. Uh, we've been seeing a lot in India recently about what's happening in terms of women. I think there are many families, particularly those who are under enormous economic stress, uh, in rural areas where there is still considerable poverty, where alcoholism is a big problem, domestic violence is a big problem, that leads to all kinds of problems, obviously, for women and for children and for families. So I think most of the issues are social issues, 
And it's the rebuilding of society that's going to be, that, that is the big challenge in this sort of post-conflict and post-tsunami period. Harry, um, how do you think government, uh, you've been working with the Ministry of Health before, uh, or civic society and other key players, um, can ensure that mental health is protected, in particular with women and, and children, and that appropriate services are available for people with uh, mental illness? Well, um, I, one, the main issue is to recognise just how important mental health is. Um, without good mental health at an individual level, at a family and community level, very little else is possible. Whether it's economic activity, whether it's actually developing society in the way that it needs to be developed during this period. So I think the first thing is recognition. I think to its credit, the, the Sri Lankan government recognises the importance of mental health. And a great deal has actually already been done. Um, you know, we were talking about suicide. The drop in the suicide rate is pretty dramatic o over a relatively short period. And that's largely a result of government action. And interestingly, it's not a result of work that's done by the Ministry of Health, but it's done by the Ministry of Agriculture. So actually doing things about safe storage, education and so on about pesticides. And I think that illustrates something else very important about mental health, that it needs to be a whole of government issue. Education is really important. Empowerment of women is absolutely critical, particularly where there are, uh, where there are real problems. And I think the Sri Lankan government, uh, if you compare like with like, that is, if you can compare countries with similar sorts of resources that Sri Lanka has, and with a similar kind of a troubled history, I think Sri Lanka is doing really incredibly well in attending to mental health issues. That doesn't mean more doesn't need to be done, a great deal more needs to be done. When we first started uh, working in Sri Lanka after the tsunami, there were more Sri Lankan trained psychiatrists in Melbourne than there were in the whole of Sri Lanka. So, you know, the shortage of skilled people is absolutely critical, and it's even worse in areas like psychology and social work and so on. All right. Um, if I can ask a question of Linnell from, from Beyond Blue. Linnell, you work very closely with the Indigenous and, and priority communities in Australia, addressing mental health concerns. Uh, can you tell us more about the work um, and a little bit more about the, the priority communities? Yes, sure, Jack. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting tonight. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all um, elders across Australia. Um, Beyond Blue identified <coughs> through the strategic directions, three major population groups, um, clearly Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, gay, lesbian, bi, trans and intersex people, and people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. This is a fairly new body of work that we've entered into, but we have done some work with um, culturally and linguistically diverse communities, um, a couple of years ago through the Universal Stories of Healing from Depression. We worked with Karen speakers from Burma. We worked with um, Afghanistan refugees and, um, and Sudanese refugees to, I guess, work, um, develop a resource that made sense to the communities. And so we worked with um, ICI Learn and um, the Australian Centre for uh, Social Innovation and three, the three community groups who were in Melbourne um, to, I guess, work out what their exploration, explanation and um, also experience of depression and how that healing happens. And it was really interesting in that they were three very different experiences so for, um, for the Sudanese people, how their experience was described was a very physical experience. So it was like a sickness. Um, whereas for the Korean speakers, it was a suffering, uh, a deep suffering. And for the Afghanistan people, 
could relate to the word d depression um, and, and understood what that, what that felt like and what that meant. And, um, and I guess we've been working with that same model with two Aboriginal communities, one up in um, remote Northern Territory and one in um, Mount Druitt as well, using a similar sort of process to develop what we're calling stories for keeping strong. Um, to help people, I guess, recognise in, within their own cultural and social context, but also what that healing might look like as well. Um. That's actually fantastic work. I mean, um, these experiences, these initiatives you've gathered uh, through Beyond Blue work, um, are these transferable to communities, developing communities, like in Sri Lanka? Yeah, definitely. I think, I think that there is some transferable ability because I guess one of the, the core principles is giving respect to diversity. You know, that um, sometimes when we're working with a, a community or group of communities, we tend to think that that experience looks the same. And, you know, the same with Sri Lanka and the different um, groups within is that respect to diversity and not making the assumption that um, that experience is going to be described in the same way. And, you know, for your counsellors, and I'm sure they do the same way, is that, yep. you know, reflective, um, reflective practice and reflective language yep. is, is useful. Thanks, Al. Look, uh, Vivian, um, yeah, I love the work you do at Mind Matters in Victoria. Um, I think, I don't know if a lot of people know what Mind Matters do. Would you like to uh, fill us in? And also, how it empowers young people to, to be a bit more uh, open to uh, talking about mental health and, and emotional wellbeing concerns? Uh, Mind Matters is actually a service that educates teachers. So we try and educate teachers about mental health and so they can work with the students. It's sort of about prevention and early intervention. And we've heard a lot here about, about suicide. And what my Matters is really on about is about trying to prevent um, suicide happening. So giving children skills about coping and skills about resilience and skills about asking for help. And seeing help seeking not as a weakness, but seeing help seeking as a strength. You know, strong people know how to ask for help. And that's the message we're trying to get through. But we do it through teachers. We do it through teachers because the teachers know their children the best. And we, as we just heard, you know, there's, there's limited mental health services in Sri Lanka. So trying to work with teachers who work with children is a really effective way of actually being able to manage it. And, and certainly the federal government in Australia, or um, Australia has had sort of high suicide rates as well. Um, felt that working through um, teachers who would work with children was a really effective way, and certainly the research has, has let us um, know that. And, and what are some of the biggest contributors here in Australia for young people with mental health and emotional concerns? Um, it's probably very similar. Um, we don't have the, the trauma, obviously, that, that Sri Lanka's had over tsunamis. Um, but things like, um, you know, Relationships that go wrong, um, child abuse, um, sexual abuse, um, family violence, um, all those um, problems that, that children face and families face are, are really big um, uh, contributors to mental illness. So it's, it's the adversity in life and I suppose what one of the things we try and do is try to give people skills and, and ways of actually managing the hard times in life, because we're all going to have hard times. The issue is how we get over them and how we how we find that courage to keep on going. Yeah. Thanks, Vivian. Carmel, um, first of all, I'd just like to thank you for, for being here. And I think it's it's a very cour courageous move for Carmel to come here and, and share her story of a very close family member committing suicide. Carmel, if you can. Um, would you like to share the story yeah. with us? I'll do my best. I will um, read from my notes because I think that might be just a little bit easier for me. And, um, you know, it was a little while ago, unfortunately, I witnessed a very close family member who took their own life and it was extremely distressing to say the least. Um, 
you know, life can prepare you for many things, but to see someone you love, I don't want to shock everybody, but hanging themselves is something that stays with you forever. The picture in your mind and the emotional state, it's there forever. Followed by a police inquiry, a coroner's quest, all these things had to be dealt with and there was many, many other things that um, had to be dealt with. It was quite overwhelming. Um, there were times when I just thought I couldn't cope, but I had to be strong and I just had to do the best I could do. I didn't know what to do, I just had to keep going. You know, it's been a life-changing experience and it's been an ongoing process to get through each day. Some days are better than others, some days are crap, some days are great. You know, fortunately, I have two wonderful children who are here with me tonight and some extraordinary friends who've provided me the foundation for my coping mechanism. I love them all very much and it's small steps to the top of the mountain and I don't know if I'll ever reach the top, but I do know with continued love and support, I'll keep trying and do my best, that's all I can do. Life is a balance and finding it can be hard, but I've travelled third world countries and seen many people do it hard every day and they still manage to smile, so I draw strength from that and keep my special memories very safe in my heart. Thank you, Carmel. And Carmel, um, you, I know you're very passionate about Sri Lanka. You actually were, was in Sri Lanka recently and you, I think you went there especially to, to visit the CCC house and, and line. What, what, what can you share there with the audience of your experience? Yeah, well, I've actually had a love affair with Sri Lanka since the early 80s when I adopted my son from Colombo. He's actually in the audience here tonight, Ashley. Uh, the country is very, very dear to my heart. I've had several trips to Sri Lanka. However, most recently was to see through my own eyes what CCC was all about. I'd read, watched and spoken about CCC Foundation. But when I arrived, I was just so pleasantly surprised and delighted to see the wonderful work CCC House is doing in providing such a comfortable, safe haven for the cancer patients and their families. It, it's at a very critical time in their lives and it just reaches out to so many people who without the CCC Foundation would be much worse off. Um, I found CCC House was amazing. I spent some time there with the staff the children and their families, and I gained a very small insight into what CCC House provides for them. Some of the families at the transit house have come from miles away, hundreds and hundreds of miles away. They've had to care for, you know, leave loved ones behind, the worry of sick children, the financial burdens, and, you know, this must be just so overwhelming for them, I, I couldn't begin to understand. Um, it was a mind-blowing, I just thought it was mind-blowing, you know, there's all these people and, I don't think one can truly understand the significance and the hard work of everybody at the Foundation. The dedication and the commitment of the staff is just absolutely remarkable. I visited also the hospital next door and spoke with doctors, nurses, parents, saw the children, and I just think it's, it's just up there with our um, Ronald McDonald House here in Melbourne. Um, however, we're here tonight to talk about CCC Line and that's something that I'm very, very passionate about. Shalanga itself, I'm passionate about, but I felt that CCC Line, it was like a quiet, sleepy other little dwelling. Um, I met the staff and had discussions with them and the call centre staff and, you know, they do such a great job. Um, I wasn't there for very long and it would have to be an exceptional person to work to pick up those phones and accept the calls. The council is a strong, calm, caring, and this is taking calls for people who are in a delicate state of mind. It, it would just take so much courage for, for both the councillor and the person to make the call. Um, you know, it, it just wouldn't be easy. Uh, I, I'd like to help raise the profile of CCC Line and take a vested interest in raising more funds. I think mental illness can be described as silent, hidden, it's a dark condition. There can be a dreadful stigma attached to mental illness and it's easy for one to turn their back on something they don't understand. So I think all of us here tonight, all of us as humanitarians, we must dig deep and raise as much awareness and funds and I believe together we can all assist the people of Sri Lanka. 
Thank you, Carmel. Thank you. Tomar, if I can um, come back to you, you have travelled the world through your cricketing career, um, and wherever you go around the world, you're surrounded by Sri Lankans, and you know Melbourne is no exception. And the Sri Lankan uh, expat community in Melbourne and throughout the world do wonderful work to to help the needy in in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. If you have to say one thing to the people in Melbourne as well as on, on a global scale about mental health and supporting mental health initiatives, what, what would you say? Well, I think uh, Carmen put it perfectly. Um, you know, it's about raising as much awareness as possible and helping Sri Lankans who are in that delicate situation take those small steps towards overcoming the issues that they are dealing with. Um, and I think mental health initiatives in Sri Lanka like CCC Line. I visited the house and they need funds. They need funds to train their counsellors. They need funds to have more counsellors available. They need financing to have more phone lines available. They need financing to keep those phone lines open for longer. And they need finances to spread the word, raise awareness, and tell people and media organizations how better and more responsibly that they, they can deal with, with mental health issues. So, we have a lot of Sri Lankans in the audience, we have a, a lot of Australians in the, in the audience. And Sri Lankans are, are known around the world to be happy-go-lucky people with a sunny disposition, always smiling. But, not everything is that obvious. Sometimes those smiles can hide something that is dark, that is slowly eating away at what was put before as, as, as the fabric of society. And mental health issues in Sri Lanka, children are the most vulnerable at this point in time. So if our responsibility is towards ourselves, then I think we owe it to ourselves to really get behind initiatives like CCC Line and ensure that we give up ourselves, our time, our finances to these initiatives. So if we can find it in ourselves to do just that, I think we would have taken a great step forward um, in a small way, but surely towards dealing with these problems more effectively. Thanks, Kwa. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please join me in thanking the whole panel here. Thanks.